members and for those uh, non-members who are taking part in this as well. And also any collateral materials such as uh, PowerPoint decks, PDFs, links and so forth, we'll have those on the respective IAP2 websites uh, within about a day or so. Uh, please leave your mics unmuted as we say we'll come to you. We've got some poll questions coming up and please take part in that too. It helps our presenters uh, get to know a little bit about you too and it's also a good way to encourage you to take part in this and to be part of this interactive presentation. So with that, hope you enjoy it. I'm going to give it back to Amelia now. Amelia? Thanks very much, Drew. So it's my pleasure now to be able to introduce our two guests uh, for today's webinar. I'm going to start off with Anne Harding. Anne brings energy and passion to her work as a senior advisor and stakeholder in Aboriginal relations for Suncor Energy's renewable energy business across Canada. Anne discovered the world of community engagement while at University of, of Calgary and has worked with over 50 Aboriginal communities across Canada since 2005 building relationships and creating positive dialogue. Her master's thesis at U of C looked at the key criteria for success in collaborative initiatives between Indigenous communities and natural resource companies. Anne is currently applying her research by leading the implementation Aboriginal Economic Collaboration and Aboriginal Workforce Development Strategies at Suncor. Anne is also immediate past president of IAP2 Canada and coordinates IAP2 Canada's Indigenous Engagement Community of Practice. Welcome, Anne. And now I get to welcome Bob Joseph. Bob is the founder of Indigenous Corporate Training Incorporated and member of the Gwa Wa A Nook. Bob, I hope I've said that correct. You can certainly. Uh, let me know soon, Nation. Uh, he has provided training on Indigenous relations to governments and companies since 1994. Bob has worked as an associate professor at the Royal Roads University in their Indigenous Corporate Relations Program. He has an educational background in business administration and international trade and is a certified master trainer. Bob's Canadian clients include all levels of government, Fortune 500 companies, financial institutions, including the World Bank, small and medium-sized enterprises, and Indigenous peoples. He has worked internationally for clients in the United States, Guatemala, Peru, and New Caledonia in the South Pacific. Anne and Bob, it's a real pleasure for us to welcome you, and I'm now going to hand it over to both of you. And Drew, if you could provide Bob with the screen. So, Bob, we're just going to get you to unmute your mic. There you go. <laughs> I was actually waiting for Drew. My apologies, Drew, for, uh, for uh, putting so much on your shoulders. I appreciate all of the hard work and organizing it. And really, uh, I've uh, done a few webinars myself. I know the, uh, the pressure that you felt up until about 30 seconds ago is going to be slowly sliding away from you here. I'm feeling crushed already. <laughs> Good, good. And, and thanks, uh, Amelia, and and looking forward to uh, talking with you and working with you on this uh, webinar for all of these uh, great attendees. Excellent, Bob. So we're just going to ask you to put your screen into slide mode so that we can see your full screen. That would be wonderful. There we go. Let me know when you uh, see it on your side there. We're good. Two thumbs up all over to you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate this uh, chance to come and talk about uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, and uh, in, in our conversations, I sort of came up with this title, Indigenous Peoples' Voices in uh, Public Process. It was something, I think, Anne, that you had said to me, or maybe even Amelia, and, and I just wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that was the focus I put on this presentation, and, and that, you know, sort of where I was coming from. I also uh, created a little uh, ebook. I know, Drew, you probably have shared it with everybody, and, um, it, and uh, the topics are actually uh, articles that I've written for our blog, and so I just compiled them into an ebook with cl clickable links, so you can go and actually have a read back of uh, everything I'm saying. I'm actually just going through my own blog notes when it comes to uh, this presentation here this morning. So, um, on the uh, subject of under oh, and I, I should say, Amelia, that was a great job on the uh, pronunciation. I just needed to uh, say that to cl clear that up. You're asking for for feedback. I know I Huawei is a is a hard uh, hard one to pronounce for many people. So 
uh, kudos. And for all of the uh, listeners, it's, it is one of the things when you are working with Indigenous peoples, both in Canada and around the world, um, that we do encourage people to really work hard on uh, the pronunciation of uh, community names and people's names. They, they do place high emphasis and high high value, and it's all part of that uh, relationship building process. So there you go. Um, just to kick us off, uh, a, a quick conversation about what UNDRIP is. So way back in September of 2007, the United Nations passed a declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, which was adopted by 144 com countries with 11 abstentions and four countries voting against it. And the four countries were actually Canada, uh, the United States, New Zealand and Australia. Um, by the close of 2010, I should just note that all four dissenting countries had reversed their positions and endorsed the declaration, sometimes with conditions. So um, it, UNDRIP is basically a, a human rights instrument adopted by the UN General Assembly following over two decades of negotiations. It sets the standard for the treatment of Indigenous peoples and states that the rights contained within it constitute the minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples around the world. And so certainly my thoughts uh, come from that as a uh, future hereditary chief of the Gwawe tribe. My dad currently is the hereditary chief for a patriarchal society. This is something that uh, we would we would lean towards quite heavily, that they are minimum standards. And, and we really do think about um, our rights in terms of well-being of our collective nations. So um, UNDRIP contains 24 preambular paragraphs and 46 articles. Uh, well, it doesn't have any legal teeth. It's a significant milestone in the march to protection and promotion of Indigenous rights of Indigenous peoples. Um, why were Indigenous rights not included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Um, uh, UDHR was drafted in 1946 after uh, World War II, but Indigenous peoples were not invited to participate. What is the purpose of the declaration? To provide a mechanism to protect the individual and collective rights of Indigenous peoples, as well as their rights to culture, identity, language, employment, health, education, protection of traditional lands, as well as, that, as, well as other issues. And um, what are the Declaration's principles in regards to rights to lands, territories, and resources? Article 26 states that Indigenous peoples have the right to own, use, develop, and control lands, territories, and resources they possess by reason of traditional occupation or use, as well as those which they have otherwise acquired. This right includes the relationship to coastal seas and waters and protecting them for future generations. Is free prior and informed consent, FPIC, covered in the Declaration? Yes, FPIC is dealt with extensively in Article 18, uh, where it says Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision making in matters which affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures as well as to maintain and develop their own Indigenous uh, decision making institutions. What were the uh, main objections? So um, obviously there were those nation states that didn't support the declaration. And their main concern had to do with um, the lands, territories, and resources, and free prior and informed consent when used as a veto. So nation states typically struggle with um, the whole concept of indigenous peoples being able to stop projects and ethnic. They, uh, definitely feared uh, would happen and worked really hard to uh, try to figure out what basically what to do with it. So when we look at um, some FPIC key dates, uh, certainly from a Canadian perspective, it's been quite a rocky road. In September of 2007, the uh, General Assembly voted on the adoption of the proposal during its 61st session. And like I say, there were uh, Canada chose to vote against the declaration um, certainly was a disappointment to uh, uh, elected leaders like uh, National Chief Phil Fontaine, former Chief National, uh, former National Chief Phil Fontaine, um, actually was so disappointed that he 
uh, in public comments stated that this is indeed a stain on Canada's reputation. Um, in December of 2007, um, they actually, uh, the AFN and other uh, Indigenous political leaders uh, were lobbying the UN um, to uh, invite Presidents Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales uh, to Canada to put pressure on the Government of Canada to uh, sign the declaration and uh, certainly had some other thoughts there as well. Uh, by uh, November 10th, uh, uh, a former National Chief of the Assembly First Nation, Sean Atlio, said that the declaration compels both states and Indigenous peoples to work together in mutual partnership and respect. And in November of 2010, Canada officially endorsed the declaration, stating, we understand and respect the importance of this declaration to Indigenous peoples in Canada and worldwide. And uh, <clears throat> by uh, May of 2016, Canada officially removed its objector status to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that's sort of the, uh, just a little bit of history on um, UNDRIP and ethic, and certainly when we think about um, those key dates and some of the things that have happened, um, some of the focus that we see currently in Canada right now is on this free prior and conformed consent and the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So definitely um, our Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau noted in his victory speech that he hoped to strengthen the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples and that was really seen as a strong signal by uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada that he would uh, indeed work to uh, to support the declaration to um, to find some way to work with free prior and informed consent and and uh, always at the heart of the conversation though is this notion of veto and that, that still I think would have people concerned within uh, the Canadian state when it comes to free prior and informed consent. Um, I should just note that the nation-to-nation uh, -nation relationship in Canada is not a new thing. It's actually been going on uh, even before Confederation. Uh, the Royal Proclamation of October 1763 really talks about uh, a nation-to-nation -nation relationship where Indigenous peoples and colonial governments would live alongside each other peacefully, coexisting, supporting each other economically, and even supporting each other militarily. Uh, should should uh, things happen that would require that. So that's the uh, sort of a historical backdrop to the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, which we think will be strengthened, especially if uh, the Government of Canada can push more towards the uh, consent side. But like I say, they've really struggled uh, with, uh, with that whole piece. Um, so when we take a look at sort of things from uh, Indigenous peoples versus Aboriginal peoples perspective around free prior and informed consent, um, from an Aboriginal peoples perspective, we've said constitutionally as a country that we're going to recognize and affirm the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal people in Canada. And in this act, Aboriginal peoples of Canada includes the Indian Inuit and Métis. The big challenge with Aboriginal peoples uh, in Canada when it comes to uh, consultation and engagement is that um, a lot of uh, the case law doesn't doesn't really push towards consent. In fact, in some cases, rare cases, the courts have talked about it. In the Delga Moot decision of December of 1997, the Supreme Court of Canada said that uh, you know we. We have to do more than mere consultation and engagement, and in some cases, we might even need full consent of the Aboriginal nations whose lands are at stake. Um, in the uh, Miccosu Cree case, they sort of changed the language a little bit, I think, in terms of what they were hoping we would do as a country on the engagement piece, and they started talking about the need to reconcile the interests of the Crown with the interests of the Aboriginal nations and uh, whose lands are at stake. So um, that's uh, Section 35 stuff where we use Aboriginal peoples. Internationally, it's Indigenous peoples. Um, un unlike Canada, there's no generally accepted definition of Indigenous peoples. Some nation states like Canada tend to think of it as uh, the people who are here first at contact, while other nation states tend to think about it in terms of their nomadic peoples within their borders. So that's um, some of the 
some of the, I guess, conversation that's happening around Indigenous peoples. And again, when it comes to that engagement, public engagement, public participation, um, Aboriginal peoples is a lesser standard than the uh, free, prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples. And that's where a lot of the conversation is today. So that when it comes to the duty to consult, like I say, when, it, uh, when we go out to engage with communities, we don't have to set up separate process, hire a warehouser, Taku River to get the, the Crown carries the duty to consult and not private companies or local governments. Um, and um, that the uh, rights are collectively held, but it, it all turns on this uh, this duty to consult and how, and, and a lot of uh, court cases that have happened really since uh, December of 1997 to really try to give us legal direction on the duty to consult. And so in Canada, there is a legal duty to consult. No development occurs, lots of policy and procedure. We all have to go and talk to them. But again, the big challenge is the uh, not consent piece that we, they, we only have to get their, their input. And it's still the Crown that decides when it's enough, um, as opposed to uh, maybe getting agreement with uh, communities. Um, and on, and on that subject, I should just say consent's a little bit of a moving target. So during the uh, victory speech, um, Justin Trudeau, in about 15 minutes in, if you could check it out on YouTube, starts to talk about strengthening the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous peoples. And I realized that uh, when I was watching it, I, I said to uh, my wife, you know, somebody, somebody at the Department of Justice uh, just had a got got a got a really big challenge thrown in front of them because we've always tried to stay the course on and Aboriginal peoples and here's a new Prime Minister in a victory speech talking about Indigenous peoples and so um, I thought maybe rookie Prime Minister new to the job just trying to struggle with terminology like many peoples I thought maybe a bit of a mistake but confirmed it a little bit later on with the appointment of uh, the Honourable Carolyn Bennett to the new Ministry of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada and so um, I, I thought, okay, they're still they're still moving towards this consent piece, and there's been a lot of conversation in the body politic about whether it includes a veto or not. And certainly, from uh, National Chief uh, Phil Fon, former National Chief Phil Fontaine's perspective, he starts to talk about a need to uh, work on collaborative consent, and uh, the Prime Minister even making comments about. Um, Vito's a part of the problem. It's the wrong conversation. So we're we're still uh, still working on it. I think the conversation is still positive, and that people just have to sort out um, how do you how do you do this around this uh, sort of touchy issue of veto and the right to to stop things. So so uh, what's a practitioner to do? Uh, really, I think. What would be most helpful for local governments, to, for businesses, for provincial and federal governments, they often think of things as a risk management process. So that's rather than waiting for actual direction, I think if you govern uh, government direction, I think if you just start to push towards where all of this is going, I think in, in time they, there will be very uh, meaningful nation-to-nation -nation relationships and we, we will be working very hard with uh, communities to get their consent or collaborative consent and so try to think about things as in terms of a risk management strategy and just in closing really quickly some very quick hints and tips for people about how we might do that personally in our jobs. Um, definitely do the research when we're working with communities. Make sure we're talking to the right people. Don't go in with tight timelines. People that go in with tight timelines, at least from the the Canadian perspective really leave themselves exposed because uh, um, it, if you if you just do the engagement in, in a timeline process, you've got 180 days to do this, but you don't get it right. It, it, they have the ability to do a judicial review to take it to court and. That'll stretch your timelines out much further. Make sure you do protocol when you're working with the communities. Thank them for uh, welcoming you to their traditional territories and to start thinking about the world in that context. We, we are a um, 
a country that recognizes that. And I know in my global experience, I, I see the protocol being very important everywhere we go. Uh, don't treat them equally. They are different. Human rights are about differences ultimately and the, the ability to be different and to maintain your cultural identity. And so if we think about people in British Columbia or Canada, the Niska people, there, there is no other place in the world where there's Niska people. So for them to be treated equally to other Canadians really means they have to give up who they are, which they're not prepared to do, and there's certainly undrip and other things that allow them the space to maintain their cultural survival aspirations. Um, don't just go when you want and need something. Early relationships are going to be the key to this engagement, and ongoing, really, the key is relationships, maybe not engagement, so I just throw that out there. Name dropping, I just came from the Guawainuk tribe, um, doesn't really help us when we're moving from community to community. We have to take into account um, they maybe have historical relationships, uh, that kind of stuff, so name dropping only with some research would we name drop. Uh, recognize their autonomy, they are, uh, don't let other people speak for them, that's uh, part of the problem with big public process. We'll select Bob Joseph to sit on our engagement advisory committee and they, the first thing I could hear them saying is, why'd you pick Bob? He's not even one of us and doesn't know anything about us. And get the wrong decision maker, definitely don't do that. And so back to some of the early comments just about UNDRIP here where the um, in, in, in the document, it actually says in government institutions of their design, if we think about the historical development of Canada, we actually created an Indian Act. And one of the things the government of Canada did was required them to elect a chief and council, even though they had traditional decision making or traditional governance already in place. So it was an attempt to uh, really do away with traditional governments in Canada. And so definitely we need to do a little bit of research to find out should we be talking to traditional leaders or elected leaders or some combination of both or one or the other. So there you go. I'll just sort of leave it for you at that and, and just say here's some contact information for, for, you, for yourselves. And I know, Drew, you're going to share this with everybody, so I won't uh, leave it up there too long. But I, I hope I did okay on the time, Drew. You did, you did just great. It's not true this time. You've got Amelia, Bob, but you did just great. And, and I think what we're going to do is uh, um, we're going to let Anne take it on now as we're heading into more of the interactive. But I know that we're going to be bringing you back and asking you all sorts of questions. And we're certainly uh, looking forward to our participants asking questions. Please do that through the chat, uh, through the question box or the chat chat boxes. We're monitoring both. So Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you, but I also think we have some poll questions. Yeah, I think that would be a great place to start just to get a sense of the folks uh, who we have online. We've got a great attendance out today, so I'm interested to see the spread. Um, so I guess we can start with the first poll question, um, just to ask people where they are located. So we recognize we've got a fair number of Canadians on the line, so we have three of those, but we also have colleagues uh, with IAP2 in Australasia and in the U.S. Um, so please uh, let us know where you're from, and I'll ask Amelia to let us know when, when that is. Yeah, so we're just going to close that poll right now, Anne, and we'll see what we've got. So our numbers are... 60% uh, from Western Canada, 13% from Central Canada, 16% from Eastern Canada, 11% from the USA, and I guess today it was a bit too early for Australasia because it would have been 4 a.m. their time, but uh, we know we will be sharing the recording with them, so we're looking forward to them joining us. And we have had a question about how many people are online with us today, and we have 74. We have 74 people online with us today. Uh, well, so true. So we know we might yeah. have a few others as well if people are sharing a, sharing a login and screen. So I think that's, that's great. That's true. We certainly have people on the telephone as well. Drew, let's see if we can get the second question up there. So asking folks what sector you work in. Um, so checking all that apply, knowing that some people work across sector in their public engagement practice. So if it's government, resource development, education, healthcare, or a different sector. Um, if you don't identify with one of those first four, please let us know and, and we'll read those out as well. Thanks. So we'll just give people a couple more seconds and then we're going to close it up. Okay, Drew, let's close it.
And so the numbers are, sorry, just let me double check that, government is 46%, resource development is 30%, education is 13%, healthcare is 9%, and 36% is other. And some of the others just consider, uh, uh, include um, a consultant in the public, uh, public sector, uh, consulting firms. So it seems to be largely consulting firms, planning consultants, and uh, recreation is another one, and so we've got a lot coming in um, that fit within the uh, within the other category, and definitely uh, the environmental sector and justice as well. So lots of others on board. Fantastic, and I think that uh, for for Bob getting to know IAP two, um, I think that's one of the great great assets of our organization is that we have people within the group who really span across uh, very many sectors and do this work in, um, in all kinds of places and, and organizations. So there's a huge diversity in the application of, of the P2 process and the work that we do. And so I think it's uh, exciting that there's so many people interested in um, incorporating Indigenous engagement into their practice in all of these different sectors. And I think we'll go with poll question number three. I'm trying to remember what it is. Does it seem like a good oh, question right. to ask right now, Amelia? <laughs> Yes, I think so. I think this will be helpful. Um, so just taking a look at it, how would you rate your level of understanding about the history and experiences of Indigenous peoples? And maybe we should have said prior to the webinar, but <laughs> however people want to respond. Um, and we're going to close that down now. And Drew? So 14% have responded as minimal. 56% as some and 30% as strong. So you have uh, quite a broad range there. So hope, we're looking forward to great, great questions. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much and thank you, Bob, for, for giving that sort of broad <laughs> overview. I talked to, to Bob in preparation for this. Um, we know that this topic is not uh, just one webinar and so we thought it would be good to put there are a few ideas out there, frame a bit of the context around the United Nations Declaration. Um, but then let's dive in where where you guys want to go and, and look a little bit more at the application to the work that we do. Um, so I'm going to go to a question that, um, that's been raised, and, and this is intended for dialogue. So I'm just going to find this here. So a bit more, Bob, you've said, um, you know, do your research is, is, I think you ended off saying, do a bit of research to find out what the protocols are in a different, in different communities, understand that each community is unique. Um, but what, how do we know that? Where do we go to, to do that research if we're not just following a legal process that has a government telling us who to consult with? How, how do you follow article, um, 36 saying whose property, whose territory you're on. I like it. I like it. Great question. Come, That's Article 25. Yeah, yeah. It come, comes up all the time. Um, so on, on the research piece, uh, our, our best tool is obviously uh, Google um, or, or the Internet if you've got a different uh, server, maybe Bing. Um, the, uh, the kinds of things that I look for, the first thing I look for uh, if you're working, you know, just going by a lot of people from BC or Alberta or Central Canada, would be to go to the uh, Government of Canada has a whole web base, ATRIS, Aboriginal Treaty Rights Information System. And uh, so it's atris.com. And uh, that would be the, the first place to start if we're contemplating working with a community after, of course, you've looked at the community's website first. So if you're working with uh, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, I would you know go to their go to their website first. Then I would um, I would head over to the Government of Canada's website, atris.com, and find out. Uh, they'll have a lot of uh, publicly available information um, about uh, Tsleil-Waututh. They'll you know tell you that they were formerly the Burrard Indian Band and that they have these economic opportunities. Here's the current chief and council, and and you know so that would be a good good uh, place if you're um, if you're uh, looking for even more information the province of BC and other provinces usually have what they call consultation area databases that you can go and take a look at 
Um, so I definitely want to go and take a look at consultation area databases and uh, start to figure out maybe who it is I should be uh, talking to. And that's what they do. Their job is to, you know, have a map of territories and to, to, to show that kind of stuff. I would also, if we were in other provinces, just to acknowledge Ontario and, the, you know, the Prairie provinces, um, certainly I'd be looking at any of the treaty offices that they might have there where they could go and find out information about member communities and maps of treaty territories. Um, those would be a, a, a good source of info uh, to start off with. Um, so uh, what, when I'm on those sites particularly, I'm trying to follow some of the other links. So when I'm on the Slavitu site, if they say they're the, a member of a section and such a tribal council, I'll go and take a look at what the tribal council does on behalf of their member communities. And so I think with just that little bit of research right there, you could start to get a really good picture of the community or communities that you're uh, targeting. I would then... Um, in order to track and see what's happening currently, I would definitely um, I would use a, a tool like Google Alerts. I don't know if Bing has this or not, or any of the other um, uh, browser systems that are out there. But uh, with Google Alerts, if I was working with Slay with Tooth, I'd want to put the Slay with Tooth Nation in there. I might put in another alert for Burrard Indian Band. I might put in another alert for the people that I'm working with specifically. If it was a project that I was uh, working on, I'd want the name of the project. And I'd just ask Google to send me weekly alerts on on those key search terms. And what Google will do is all of the heavy lifting and it'll send you results back for who the, you know, if the chief was there and you put the chief's name in, it would send you the chief made comments on on this project. So we let Google sort of do the heavy lifting for us because we're probably, you know, we have other kinds of work that we're doing, but it's a way really to track people and communities and issues in a really easy, and it's free Google Alerts cheap way to uh, to do that. So a combination of research and um, Google Alerts. And then the last thing I would do is I would try to I would try to find people in uh, both levels of government, federal and provincial governments, who uh, if I know they've done any work there, I could go and ask questions at just a quick phone call. Hey, Ann, I haven't worked with Slaywood before. Uh, can you give me any... Uh, any pro tips, any things to watch out for. So I'd make a couple of phone calls to both federal and a provincial government. I would also uh, maybe try to have a, a really good uh, consulting friend that I could phone and ask information for information about a particular community. So if you, if you do all of that, it shouldn't take you a whole bunch of time, but you'll be way more prepared than most people that don't go in assuming the wrong things and, and uh, so. There, there you go. I hope, I hope that helps. Did I, did I stay on track with the question? Yeah, yeah, you definitely did. And there's, you know, there's a ton of layers to it that, that I think we'll get to as well. Um, I'm actually going to put one other poll question up. Um, well, two more poll questions up, and, and Drew and Amelia, I can run them from here, I think. Um, so I, we have a few other questions coming in, um, and I'm trying to get your sense for the next sort of 20 minutes that we've got together where where we should be spending our time and focusing. So I think I've launched a poll. Uh, have I, Amelia? Did I do that right? Uh, uh, no, we we don't uh, we don't have the poll. So just a second. I think perhaps then we'll do it at our end if that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay and and we'll see what we can do. So uh, Drew, can you launch that poll, please? Which specific topic? The the fourth. Yeah. Uh, just a second, and sorry. That's okay. And I may have just messed it up by trying to do it myself. That will teach me. Um, so in the meantime, Bob, I'm going to throw throw another question your way um, and to talk about the concept of self-determination. So I think this is something that um, we hear. It's referenced in, in the declaration. Um, but I'm wondering if you can share with us some examples of what self-determination might look like in from an indigenous community perspective. Excellent, excellent. So uh, self-determination um, is like it sounds. Uh, we have the right to determine who our people are in the uh, Canadian context, just going by the poll question for a lot of the participants seem to be from Canada. Um, and some from the US, and I think there'd be similar experience there too, but um, from the uh, Canadian perspective, uh, uh, Canada 
um, at Confederation decided that the best thing that could happen for uh, what the terminology in the day, 1867, was Indians and lands reserved for Indians, um, the, uh, uh, decided that it would uh, try to assimilate Indians and uh, through a, in a post-Confederation assimilation process. And so it actually um, sent Indian agents out to communities across the country with a pen and a piece of paper. And uh, they showed up in your community and they'd walk up to you literally and just say, uh, you know, could, what, what's, what's your name? And you would say, Aksum Nakwala. And they would say, okay, Bob Joseph, it is. And they put your name down on a, on, a, on a list of names. So I always get asked, are you related to the Josephs in this community or the Josephs in that community? And I always tell people, no, I'm not, but I'm pretty sure we had the same Indian agent. So a little bit of uh, Indian affairs humor for you about the whole, the whole status Indian system. So we create, we legally create a category of people that were going to try and unlegally define. We legally racially define and we look for ways to uh, unlegally racially define. So we're going to take them as status Indians at first and then they'll become non-status Indians if we are able to, through legislation, get them to assimilate. So um, it's at that time that the federal government started deciding or determining who Indians were. And then the goal was to uh, get their names off of the list. And it's, uh, from the perspective of the people, a very sort of divisive thing. So it means that you start losing family and people to a, a greater and broad, more broader politic. In fact, during the heyday of assimilation, if you lost your status, so women particularly who lost status to a marriage of non-Indian men would lose their status. They had to actually leave the reserve and, and go live somewhere else. So the notion of self-determination um, really is about we get to decide who our people are. It's, nobody in Ottawa gets to decide who our people are. That's what they would tell you in a nutshell, self-determination really means. And some of the models that we've seen, probably, you know, uh, the Niska Nation uh, in the treaty that they signed with the federal and provincial government said that you uh, only need to show descendancy to a Niska matriarch to participate in the activities of the Niska Nation. So through negotiations, they were able to sort of codify their membership code and their provisions. So that's the, uh, one of the three selves that they're asking for, actually, self-determination, self-government, um, and self-reliance. Those would be the three selves. That's great. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. And, and thank you, Amelia and Drew, for uh, fixing my errors on the fly. Um, so we've got the poll up for what specific topics you're interested in learning more about in this bit. And seeing that uh, the majority of folks, and we forced you to pick one, so I apologize for, for that forced prioritization there, but is how can I respect Indigenous decision making at 58%? And uh, how can I engage with Indigenous people off reserve at 25%? And so that, that lines up with uh, some of the questions that have been coming in as well. Um, so Bob, I want to continue on that path about decision making and protocol. Um, so IAP2, is all about process, is all about um, engaging people in decisions that affect them. And so when I look at the United Nations Declaration and I look at Article 18, that very much is the core of what IAP2 is about, is that Indigenous people have the right to participate in decision making in matters which would affect their rights through representatives mm -hmm. chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures. Mm -hmm. as well as maintain and develop their own Indigenous decision-making institutions. So for all, all IAP2 folks who want to focus in on UN DRIP, that Article 18 is, is really, in my mind at least, where that alignment happens and where we take the discussion from here. So, so Bob, how, what does that look like? Because obviously in Canada we're dealing with um, a, you know, extreme colonization and, and Western decision-making processes having been imposed. There are regions where, where there are modern treaties like the NISCA and, um, and that self-government is, is increasing. But I think in the, in the majority of situations, at least from my perspective and my experience, there's, there are Western decision-making models uh, that are pervasive through communities. And so is chief and council the place to go? Um, are the tribal leaders in the... Uh, it's, you know, as the chairman of the tribe in, in the U.S., the, the place to go, and if you get their consent, does that mean you have consent of the community? So if you can talk a bit more about decision-making processes and how we respect those. 
I like it. I like it. Um, so they're, they're definitely, uh, you know, tribes as well as bands, we call them in Canada. Um, you know, part of the process would see them begin to elect a chief and council. Like I was saying, it's a really a direct imposition on self-governing communities that they are required to begin to elect people. I think, you know, they, they could have went that way eventually uh, and naturally, but really we're talking about instances where nation state governments really force those ideas, as you were saying in your comments there, on indigenous peoples. And so um, it's, a, it's a tough web to sort yourself out sort of through and honestly I get really concerned when I hear people say oh I talked to the I talked to the Ben chief he's a good friend of mine and uh, we went to the Calgary Flames game last night and he says everything's okay with what we're talking about but that for me is a really concerning sort of uh, look at engagement it's not uh, I mean it could be proper but it, but it could also not and so you've kind of got a 50 50 chance there that you're you're talking to the right people and so the the framework that I tell people to use when it comes to decision making is really a collective rights approach when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, making decisions uh, in communities about, say, a big project, maybe a pipeline project or a mine or a forestry approach or, or, or you know a cut block or something like that. So the uh, collective rights approach says that we cast a wider net. Um, obviously, we've got to start somewhere, so I think the elected leaders are probably the easiest to find. But in our work, we need to be asking lots of really good questions about, um, is there anybody else I should be talking to? Um, sometimes the elected leaders don't want us talking to anybody else, and that's problematic for the practitioner as well, because that means they're gatekeeping, you really are at the uh, mercy of a gatekeeper. And, uh, you know, I say mercy, I've seen really good treaty packages get voted down, I've seen good impact benefit agreements get voted down, because the community didn't know what the elected leader was doing. And so, um, if we want to sort of take a different approach, we think about the rights as collectively held, and we try from the beginning to figure out how to talk to a collective group of people. So we're going to take what we do on a macro level for, you know, uh, communications and engagement, and we're going to apply it right in a community of 50, 200, 300, 500 people. We're going to do the same kinds of things. We're going to we're going to talk to the elected leaders. We'll find traditional leaders. We're going to talk to the grassroots people. And you guys are really good at all the stuff that you need to do to do that. That's your toll-free phone numbers, places where they can leave comments on the internet. Uh, you know, going to public events, you might shift up the strategy a little bit and go to powwows or potlatches or feasts, you know, try to find places where they're gathering to collect input on on the participation or in, during the participation process just to try and get some feedback. And, um, but, uh, and then when it comes to um, um, sort of how do we, how do we know and we've got success, right? Like how many, like is it, is it 50% plus one? Is that, is that what lets us know that we're okay with the community? And I think when it comes, it's back to that collective uh, perspective. I know I, I can talk a little bit about um, Squamish Nation did a good job. They had a, they had an, an issue that they had to uh, settle in the community, uh, a grievance that they had, and they were offered a really, um, a cash settlement to sort of, you know, make the uh, problem go away, and they decided in their participation process um, that um, they needed more than 50% plus one because they're a collective group of people. They, they said, are we going to make sure 70% of our people support this? And they actually went out with that as part of their plan. Part of their public participation plan really included um, town hall sessions. They said, they're, and this would be probably different than most of the metrics that you, you, you folks might use where they actually said, we're going to run town hall sessions until people stop showing up, because that's when we'll know we've sort of satisfied their interests and concerns. So I thought that was a really neat metric in terms of, uh, you know, public participation uh, from on a micro level with uh, an indigenous community. So definitely some good uh, good insights, but uh, like I say, a collective approach, if you're talking to a collective group of people, um, that, that would always be most helpful. It'll help, uh, if you put the focus there, you don't have to wait until this issue between the traditional and the elected leaders and all of that stuff has to get sorted out 
because you can do that. It just takes a long time for it to get sorted out, or we can just go in with this collective approach. I hope that helps, Anne. It, it does, and, and thanks for those examples. Um, the example of commerce, that's a neat, neat idea. I hadn't heard about that. Um, so one of the questions we've had, though, along those lines, so say you're taking a collective approach and you hear different opinions or mm -hmm. different advice from people within the collective. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you handle that? How do you respond to that? I think um, it's, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge and, uh, you know, that's just how we, when we're dealing with conflict, you know, if you studied uh, conflict resolution, uh, we need to acknowledge that stuff. So I think um, back to the Squamish example, they, they took all of the opinions and the ideas, every question that came into them, they, you know, uh, they provided an answer publicly on a website and, you know, they sort of kept the conversation to make sure they brought it up during the participation session. So they acknowledged uh, the differences and, you know, actually encouraged additional conversation to try and get it sorted out. And I think that, that would be the, the first main step is, you know, we went out, we engaged, here's what we found, here's the places of support, here's places where they still have issues, and let's let's work on these issues, right? If you look at, um, you know, there's there's a couple of big pipeline projects that are really struggling right now, and it's because a really uh, small section of the community is, is uh, not comfortable with what's going to happen. In fact, uh, they're kind of two different examples. One the elected leader really wants it, but the community seems to be saying no. And then in another, there's a, a small group of people within a, in a larger community who are unhappy with it. So we need to make sure that we get those sooner than later. The problem with, you know, finding out after we've done the engagement is it's hard to go back and mend fences and build the trust and to do that kind of stuff, right? So we wanna, if we want to do this, we've got to do the open, transparent approach and make sure that we acknowledge and we're providing answers. And, and uh, so I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's sort of a, the best thing that we can do. In fact, uh, in the engagement process itself, you know, some of the best practice, I think, would be to go and work with them on how to set it up. What would work for this community? You know, well, as a practitioner, I'm a professional, I know lots of ways we can do stuff, but we're calling on the whole community here to help us. What's the best approach we should take with this community to, to have a conversation about this thing that we're working on? That would be, a, that would be the ideal if you could get, get into that sort of stuff. But it's longer term relationship building, I think, that it would be required. That those conversations become a lot easier when when you already have that relationship and understanding. Yeah, most of the people that we struggle with the tight timelines. That's what's killing them, right? They're yeah. they're pushing, they're hiring the practitioners to to run it. I need this answer in 180 days, and it, it just it's you know it's hard to get that. In fact, you know you're risking your reputation and you know all, all kinds of stuff there. It would be better if we if we had just a, a little bit more time. There, um, you know, like common messages are they're not against development, but it can't be development at all costs. So if we can find out what their concerns are, it might be possible to actually do this. But to be able to listen to their concerns is probably another uh, big challenge in there as well. Um, you know, in the West Moberly decision, it turned on a herd of care, 12 caribou, a, a big mine wasn't going to get built because of a herd of 12 caribou. And people were just, you know, in a rush to get the development approved. And anyways, it ended up in court and, you know, eventually they were sent back for, you know, more engagement with some harsh words from the courts on, you know, they gave you concerns. Um, it doesn't seem like anybody wanted to listen to them, and we're not prepared to see that happen. So go back and do it again, you know, if you're if you're still interested. So it really is uh, the the listening becomes critical in that process too. How to, listening to the yeah. little yeah. yeah, thank you, and I think that a lot of that line aligns with the IAC two core values that you know having input in from participants and designing how they participate and being transparent about um, how what input was received and how it was addressed uh, and allowing people to participate in a meaningful way. So very much al aligning with the work that we, we definitely endeavored to do. Um, I've got just one quick question, somebody wanting to clarify, when you were talking about the NISCA, the three cells, self-determination, self-government, and there's another one. Self-reliance. Self Self-reliance, okay, just clarifying that. 
Um, and so now I want to shift a little bit um, into an urban context or into a context where it's not engaging, you know, it's not two-way engagement where there's, say, a decision maker, whether that's a, a developer or a project or a government engaging just with an indigenous community in a specific geography. But what about our practitioners who are working in urban context in, um, say, for a municipality um, or for a city and they're looking to build a light rail transit line or look at park redevelopment or even education or healthcare programming? Um, how, how can, what is Indigenous engagement and, and even UN DRIP, how does that apply in a context of broader public participation processes? I'm going to wrap into that, um, just the question I had in advance, where somebody said they've been told that um, Indigenous people don't like being referred to as a stakeholder or as the public. And so I'm going to ask you to address that as well. All right. Which one do you want me to tackle first? All of them. All of them together in five minutes. Actually, Amelia, I just wanted to clarify, how long are we on this webinar for? Um, we do actually um, host the webinars until quarter past the hour, but we often lose most people right on the hour end. So you, you have about uh, 25 minutes left, but if you can get most of it in within the next 10 to 15 minutes, that would be great. Okay, good stuff. So yeah, right. Bob, go. I'm just going to turn up my braid of speech another notch here. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm amusing myself here. Uh, stakeholder, I'll tackle that one first. Yes, anything that you can do to uh, pull a stakeholder out of the uh, vernacular would be uh, appreciated. Uh, many, many chiefs have said we, we don't like to be called stakeholders. You know, from a project development perspective, if the Rod and Gun Club doesn't like what you're going to do as an organization, they can lobby MPs and they can lobby MLAs and they can, you know, try to do a negative media campaign even, really, to try and stop a, a firm from doing what it's thinking it wants to do. Um, where the uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada have the ability to tie projects up for three to five years and legal wranglings with things like uh, judicial reviews. And so that would be the uh, painful lecture that you would get, yeah, we're here to talk to you because you're a stakeholder on our list and we really want your help and your feedback. And so um, they, uh, they get really upset when we call them stakeholders because they, in, in Canada they have constitutionally protected rights. Internationally they have, you know, the, the undrip and the free prior and informed consent. So they, they do tend to think of themselves as different than other stakeholders. And, and we can list them as such too. That might be the easiest thing for us to do. We're committed to working with national governments, provincial governments, First Nations governments, and stakeholders to, you know, come up with an answer to this conversation. So you could, you could uh, sort of uh, spread it out that way. But they do get upset. If you really want to, you know, that would be, you're in a meeting with a community. If you really wanted to get them upset, say stakeholder, one person on the council would have to come after you. Uh, throw in Crown Lands. Hey, we're here to talk to you because you're a stakeholder in our list about Crown Lands. That Crown Lands comments, the bench clearing brawl, they, they will definitely uh, have issue with that, especially in Canada where they weren't conquered and they didn't assimilate. And, and in fact, actually, in the recent case, the Tsilkotin case, the court actually awarded the land not to the crown but to the indigenous peoples. So those would be some of the issues that they'd have around terms like stakeholder and crown land. And certainly if you uh, get, get a copy of the the, the ebook that I know Drew is going to share with everybody, you can go download all of our hints and tips about what not to say and those would be a couple that, that would rank high. Now to in urban indigenous engagement, um, I think, you know, you think about a place like Vancouver, you actually have some communities. So you've got Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Squamish, Semiamu, Sawasan. So there, there, there would be some engagement that we'd do that way. But I, you know, I think more specifically, you're talking about uh, Indigenous peoples in the urban setting. So I, I'm thinking that your uh, consultation and engagement would be with um, organizations in the urban setting. And uh, top of mind would be, Friendship centers would be a good place to go and meet, and I think that, you know some of the emphasis there. There, you know, there doesn't have to be a separate process, but I think we could be more effective if we actually go to places where they are meeting. And and uh, you know, I know for uh, many urban Aboriginal peoples in Vancouver, they have a hard time with transportation. So if you want to meet them, you've got to try to figure out where they're meeting. 
in the urban setting. Friendship centers would be a logical place. You know, some of their organizations, the Native Women's Association of Canada, the Calhoun State Investment and Trade Association, you know, uh, Urban Aboriginal Youth Anya Association would be a place if you were trying to meet a, a younger demographic. And they've got facilities uh, sprinkled throughout uh, the, the downtown core. And I would definitely try and connect up with uh, people that way through those things. I would look for big events like the Calgary Stampede. You know, it's got a great big First Nations component. That would be a great place to go and, you know, set up a, a booth and just talk to all of the people coming through, Indigenous peoples included. Um, so I'd do that. I'd look for major sporting events. So the um, first All Nations basketball tournament in Prince Rupert is attended by hundreds of communities and it all happens up in uh, Prince Rupert once a year. So those would be great places to, to go engage in the uh, urban setting uh, with urban Indigenous peoples. Definitely those big events. I know Squamish has a powwow this weekend. Uh, so that would be a, those would be the kinds of places that I'd want people to, to, uh, to go and do that. Does that help, Pam? Was that what we were looking I think for? It, yeah, I think it does. It aligns with, uh, yeah, my experience as well. And, and I'll plug in the Sitsuna powwow that's happening uh, just outside of Calgary at Bragg Creek at the end of this month as well for folks in this region. Um, just looking through, noting our time here, um, I've got a question. Bob, interested in hearing your views of the CAFCA Collaborative Agreement? Um, I, I would love to share them, but I don't actually have any. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down and go, go have a look at it. Uh, but anything with collaborative, in my mind, is sending the right message. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. That's good. Um, and so we, we, I know we have some folks on the um, line who are part of the government and, and part of a government body, whether that's uh, provincial or federal. And, and so I've got a question specific to that of what, what are the biggest frustrations that Indigenous people face during public participation or conflict resolution processes with government? Um, I think part of it is uh, we tend to come across, um, I met this guy Joe Gosnell from uh, the Niska Tribal Council years and years ago and he, he had been at the table negotiating treaties for 27 years on behalf of the Niska and with the Niska of course, and, uh, but a great leader, great man, uh, went to school with my dad uh, in residential schools in Alert Bay. Um, I had a chance to, to meet him one time and I asked him, if you had to spend a majority of your life, or, 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 or if, if you had to explain to people what it is that you've done with your life, how would you describe that in a sentence? And his response still sticks with me, and I tell the story in my training sessions and that. And he said, "Well, he thought about it for a, you know a good minute, and then he finally said, well, I, I'd honestly have to say I've spent a majority of my life trying to wrestle power from defenders of the empire. And so I think that's probably their biggest challenge is uh, wrestling power from defenders of the empire. And what he was really, uh, you know, I interpreted he was calling for was we need to work together on stuff. It doesn't have to be us and them. And, you know, we, we've got interests. We've got a place and a space. And so I thought it was uh, probably their biggest frustration is that we, you know, just we come across like we're defending the empire. And a lot of my advice really focuses on on not doing that, you know. So when I meet people in the province, say, you know, give me your introduction, tell me what you're going to say. Ah, well, here's how I normally start. I'm here to talk to you because you're a stakeholder on our list, and I want to talk to you about crown lands. And then so I give them the explanation about crown lands and stakeholder, and you know, provide advice on the crown lands. You actually don't actually have to say crown lands. There shouldn't be any reason in your communication that you're saying that. You can, in fact talk about their territory because we acknowledge it as a country, it's acknowledged in the states and everywhere you go where there's indigenous people, they, they have territory and it's acknowledged and so let's go in and talk about their territory, not about crown land. So sometimes just shifting up our language and our communication will really change the way we, you know, how our engagement goes. Um, you, you think about the U.S. experience, this is where our U.S. listeners here, the, um, 
you know, a few years ago in Denver, they arrested 87 American Indians arrested protesting Columbus Day. What were they protesting? It wasn't parades. It wasn't celebrations. It really was the communications. And if we could change the communications up at the time Columbus arrived, as opposed to when Columbus discovered America, you, you wouldn't have to have a police force capable of arresting 87 American Indians. It, would just, it just wouldn't be a problem. So I think a lot of it is really you know shifting the paradigm and coming up with language that really is much more collaborative and you know working together as opposed to defending that empire so i hope that i hope that's what you're looking for in terms of yeah i think that's that's a really good frame and and i i think it's language matters it's it's an important component um and i'm sure we could go down that road a fair bit more i'm going to ask amelia or drew to launch the poll question that, that asked about IAP2, and so for those folks who are able to stay with us for another 10 minutes or so, I'm, I'm interested in um, hearing your thoughts and, and Bob's as well about IAP2 as, as an organization and um, if we should be doing more than we have been in the past to increase Indigenous inclusion in the practice and in our organization. I can't remember which one of those the question asks, so, so we'll launch that poll. Thanks, Anne. We'll just get Drew to launch that for us. Sorry, what poll was she on this? Uh, so about IAP2? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a very quick question, so if we could ask people to respond to it. And Drew, let's close it right now. Uh, well, that was easy, Anne. That was 100%. <laughs> to yes. Okay, so should IAP2 do more? Well, great news. We are excellent that, uh, that there's an interest in that. Um, so when, when Amelia did my intro, she talked about the Indigenous um, Engagement Community of Practice. So this is a group that was launched um, officially in January of this year, but grew out of a subcommittee that existed last year to um, look at recommendations. Uh, to develop recommendations for the IAP2 Canada Board specifically on how to increase Indigenous inclusion both within the organization of IAP2, again specifically Canada, and um, the practice more broadly. And, and so those recommendations are being worked by this Indigenous Engagement Committee of Practice who are um, IAP2 members who engage with Indigenous communities. That's and, and people. That, that's sort of the criteria for the group. Um, and I've had a question if the community of practice is open only to Canadian members, and no, I believe we said IAP2 members. Um, so it's in, for the IAP2 Canada board is where the recommendations come from, but certainly we would welcome, um, in, welcome engagement from others as well. Part of what we are looking at is actually UN DRIP is saying, okay, what does this mean for the IAP2 framework? So IAP2 has um, the internationally recognized and held uh, three foundations, which is our spectrum, um, our code of ethics, and our core values. And um, what, where does UNDRIP fit on that? Where does engagement with Indigenous peoples fit on that? In my mind, a lot of our framework is very much based on a specific decision at a point in time um, and so it doesn't necessarily promote uh, relationship building. And it is, in, again, in my perspective, a, a more time-focused uh, than is perhaps appropriate or effective in engaging with Indigenous communities. Furthermore, um, and somebody's mentioned on, on the question box that looking at the right hand of the spectrum, so the collaborate and empower level of the spectrum, how what are there ben what benefits are there to indigenous communities for participating along with others? Is what does it mean to truly collaborate or empower in, within the IAP2 framework um, with indigenous communities? And so looking at some of this and and saying, okay, how let's actually declare how this all fits together. So all of that is my plug for if you want to be part of this uh, conversation to to please do feel free to join us and and look to us to. Um, to continue to raise this conversation. Um, another piece of work that's, that's coming out of this group is to provide more education and awareness and uh, learning opportunities for IAP2 leadership. So 
how do we do more of these webinars um, for the leadership of IAP2 as well as our, our broader membership as well. So I'll also put a plug for those who are attending the conference, the North American Conference in Montreal. Um, at the end of September, we're going to have a three-hour workshop on reconciliation and uh, an Indigenous some Indigenous awareness, but more about reconciliation and what is our role as practitioners in that process. Um, definitely understanding the context is the first place to start. And so what that will do is support some of what Bob's talking about in just understanding the context enough so that you can use language that reflects that understanding and reflects that intent. I think there's a Amelia, I, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to share that um, you know there's a lot of people who have done some engagement and really just don't want to screw up, they just don't want to say the wrong thing. And, and I think there's some of that hesitation within our organization as well. And so we're working to, to build those bridges and, and to make that a more comfortable space for everyone. Um, so where to go from here and some final conversations is, let's see. Actually, would like to open it up to anybody who wants to raise their hand to have a final question or comment, um, either related to the IAP2 spectrum or a specific question that, that you want to ask Bob or something that you want to share from your experience, because I know we do have a wealth of experience on the, on the call as well. And, and while we're waiting for people to ask questions, I think I'd just like to pop in with one that was that was asked, and it's also one that I have too, and that is, um, is it possible to have sort of, um, I know you've talked a lot about collaboration, but is it just collaboration between the client and Indigenous communities, or is it collaboration and cooperation between the client, Indigenous communities, um, neighborhood associations, uh, schools? Is it is it a bigger, broader collaboration? So that could you just help me understand that one? She said, "And <laughs> yes is the answer to all of that." Um, I, I think it's good. my my answer would just be it's collaboration in the context that is context specific. Um, I think reconciliation is a collaborative process. Uh, so for those who are interested in um, well, for those who are interested in being citizens, uh, but in participating in reconciliation, that in itself is a collaborative process. Um, I think it's you know the definition I I'm familiar with of collaboration is working together toward a common goal, and so I think. You can try to collaborate all you want, but if you don't have the same goals or the same interests as, as the person on the other side or the group on the other side, um, and you understand that you share that interest, then you can't collaborate. And so I think collaboration needs to start from a place of understanding, and, and I think that's understanding um, how people want to collaborate. I don't know if that that's, helps. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> nice that Anne just passed the torch. Uh, you took it on for you, Bob. It was good. Um, we have. <laughs> John Emery on the line and yeah. he's raised his hand. So John, you've muted yourself. So if you want to unmute yourself, uh, you can ask your question. Go ahead, John. Oh. It looks as, so John's mic's open, but apparently um, we're not able to hear him. So John, if you wanted to send us a question, we'd be happy to do that as well. Perfect. So just and we just had one other question come through about who how do contact to join the Indigenous Engagement Community of Practice. So you can just send Amelia a note at info at iap2canada.ca. Yep, I'm the right person, and I'd be happy to do it. And for the Americans that are on the call, if you want to send it to Amelia at iap2usa, uh, you can do that as well, and I'd be happy to respond as well. So, Anne, I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions coming in. I don't see any. Uh, hopefully, we've responded to everyone's questions today. Um, and I don't see any other hands up. So I think with that, I am going to uh, say 
a big sincere thank you to both Bob and Anne for joining us today and, and sharing your experiences and your knowledge about Indigenous engagement and UNDRIP. I know for a lot of us it's very new and I'm one of those persons that uh, really want to become engaged and involved in Indigenous engagement, but I'm a little bit scared, I'm a little bit trepidatious. So all of the hints and tips that you're providing are, are very much appreciated. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we do have another learning webinar coming up in August, August 9th. Uh, it will take place at 2 p.m. and we're going to focus on research at our next, uh, on our next webinar. We'll be taking a look at the white papers that were created for IEP2 and, and sharing a little bit more about that. So we're hoping that people will join us for that. But just before we close up, um, I, I just want to give the last word to Anne and Bob uh, and as, as we sign off. So Anne, over to you and then to Bob. Thanks very much. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, we do have that final note from John and I'd like to reiterate that, that a, a recognition that Indigenous communities as, as the profile is increasing as, and as we are raising our collective understanding about the importance of engaging with Indigenous communities, they are swamped um, with inquiries and people looking to, to engage. And so that just a note of caution that we should be careful about balancing our desire to engage with the desire and capacity of those communities to come along um, on that journey as well. And, and I think Bob has said it a number of times to, to go where they're at. And, and I would echo that to meet communities where, where they're at. So thank you and, and thank you for your interest in continuing the conversation with us along the way. So Bob, over to you. Thanks, Anne. I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come and meet with the um, IAP2 crowd again. I, I've done it in the past, and it's always uh, it's always great to hear the kinds of questions that people are uh, looking for. And great working with you again. And Drew, way to uh, way to pull this webinar together and and do the uh, do the hard work behind the scenes there as a as a webinar organizer. So uh, and to the I. AP2 practitioners who are listening, we really uh, hope you got a lot out of it. And uh, you know, I don't mind uh, people reaching out and asking questions afterwards if you feel like you didn't have enough time. And yeah, good, good luck working with the communities. I think it becomes more, not less. It becomes harder, not easier, but for the right people with the right training, with the help of an association such as yourselves, I think the opportunities are incredible and super rewarding too because from our perspective you'll be helping save our nations, help them grow and strengthen and, and really uh, have a place and space within the broader society. So thank you very much everybody. Thanks well, so thank much Bob and we've just got one comment I'll just plug in there from David saying that the Assembly of First Nations Annual General um, meeting is streaming live right now for anybody who's interested. So just look at Assembly of First Nations. Um, so if anybody's interested in understanding what those decision-making processes look like, uh, there's a live opportunity. Thanks, Anne. And just a quick reminder to all of the participants that we will be sharing uh, today's recording and uh, the uh, Bob's ebook that he talked about and any other materials uh, that Bob and Anne provide to us, including links and PowerPoints and things like that. So more information to come to us, uh, to come from us over the next 24 to 48 hours. So thank you very much for participating. We look forward to seeing you next week. Please never hesitate to get in contact with us. We love to hear from you. Uh, and uh, you can contact us, Bob or Anne, if you want to know more about today's webinar and have future questions on that. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now. Anne?